Schweitzer. I'm a heart failure and transplant cardiologist at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis and the editor-in-chief of Circulation Heart Failure. And I'm here today with Mikhail Kutzbad, who is the primary investigator of the STEP HEPFEP trial that you just heard the results announced at ESC. Mikhail, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. It's always great to be with you, Nancy. Tell us about the patients enrolled in this trial first. Who were they? Right. Well, um, step half was really the first uh, clinical trial of any pharmacotherapy that was specifically designed to test a hypothesis that targeting obesity uh, can be an efficacious therapeutic strategy in patients with uh, heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. Um, and so accordingly, uh, we recruited patients that had a diagnosis of half uh, clinical diagnosis of half uh, that uh, had a preserved ejection fraction defined in this trial as 45% and higher, and uh, that had obesity um, uh, defined as um, a BMI of 30 uh, or higher. Um, and then on top of that, they had to have at least one of the three things, either documented elevated filling pressure is measured invasively uh, or um, uh, elevated uh, natriuretic peptides that were stratified in terms of the threshold based on BMI uh, plus structural echocardiographic abnormalities or uh, hospitalized with heart failure within the previous 12 months uh, plus either ongoing requirement for diuretic therapy or structural uh, echocardiographic abnormalities or both. Uh, so those were the kind of the three ways that patient could uh, become eligible for the study. And um, uh, the uh, uh, trial design was such that once the patients fit, um, uh, fulfilled all the inclusion and none of the exclusion criteria, uh, they were then, and you know, once they agreed to participate in sign informed consent, they were then randomized uh, to either semaglutide uh, with a target dose of 2.4 milligrams once weekly or placebo and treated for 52 weeks. Uh, with a five-week follow-up period. And uh, the primary endpoints in the trials, there were actually two dual primary endpoints. The first was change in Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, or KCCQ Clinical Summary Score, <clears throat> which is a gold standard of measuring symptoms and physical limitations due to heart failure. And the second dual primary endpoint was a change in body weight uh, from baseline to week 52. And we had uh, several um, key secondary endpoints that were also um, tested in the hierarchical sequence as well. So um, give us the top line results first with primary endpoints. We'll get into your secondary endpoints. Uh, sure. Uh, so first of all, for the first dual primary endpoint, KCCQ clinical summary score, uh, what we saw is that patients treated with semaglutide uh, had significantly greater improvement in the symptoms and physical limitations as measured by KCQ clinical summary score. Uh, that benefit was already apparent at week 20 and continued to be amplified during the trial, such that at 52 weeks, uh, there was an estimated treatment difference between semaglutide and placebo of 7.8 points in favor of semaglutide that was highly statistically significant uh, with a p-value of less than 0.001. And for the second uh, dual primary endpoint change in body weight, this was also uh, favorable to semaglutide. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, patients that were treated with semaglutide had a significantly greater reduction in body weight. At 52 weeks, um, the estimated treatment difference was 10.7% of body weight uh, favorable to semaglutide versus placebo, uh, with a p-value also highly significant at less than 0.001. So really impressive results, both in terms of the quality of life of these patients and the absolute value of weight loss. Um, and absolutely congratulations on that. And as you showed in your presentation, the uh, difference between the two groups is apparent on both of these endpoints very early and continues to grow over the full 52 weeks. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we see the benefits earlier on uh, and they continue to be amplified for both dual primary endpoints throughout the trial. Really interesting. And so tell us about the secondary endpoints, because I know the audience really wants to hear about those as well. Uh, absolutely. So we had three uh, key secondary endpoints, and what I mean by key uh, is that these were included in the hierarchical sequence of testing, and so they had what we call alpha protection, 
uh, or control for type 1 error um, in the way they were tested. Uh, so the first of these was a change in six-minute walking distance uh, between baseline and week 52, and uh, we observed that patients treated with semaglutide had significantly greater improvement in the six-minute walking distance. That, again, was seen earlier in the trial, but amplified at the end of the trial at 52 weeks, at which point uh, estimated treatment difference was 20.3 meters uh, in favor of semaglutide as compared with placebo that was Again, highly statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0.001. Uh, the second um, was uh, hierarchical composite endpoints. This was a composite that included clinical events, such as death from any cause and heart failure events, as well as certain thresholds of change in KCQ, clinical summary score, and six-minute walking distance. That was highly favorable to semaglutide as compared to placebo as well. The uh, stratified win ratio at week 52 was 1.72. Uh, so remember, for win ratios, it's the opposite of hazard ratio. The, um, uh, the higher the number above one, the more beneficial it is for an intervention as compared with uh, placebo in this case. So here is a win ratio is 1.72 in favor of semaglutide uh, with the p-value of less than 0.001. And I should mention that uh, essentially, every component uh, of this composite endpoint uh, was favorable uh, to semaglutide as compared with placebo and contributed to this uh, very favorable win ratio. Uh, and then the last one in hierarchical sequence was C-reactive protein, which also was uh, reduced more in patients treated with semaglutide as compared with placebo. That benefit was also seen earlier uh, in the trial and was amplified at week 52, at which point the estimated treatment ratio was 0 0.61 uh, for semaglutide as compared with placebo, so favorable to semaglutide with a uh, highly significant p-value of less than 0 0.001. So I think the best way to summarize it is that the trial met all uh, of the primary and confirmatory secondary endpoints convincingly with very, very highly significant p-values. Again, congratulations, and I think really uh, interesting data that will spur a lot more scientific exploration, right? The CRP data are very interesting to suggest that maybe there's an inflammatory component in this obesity phenotype that's uh, detrimental and contributing both to exercise intolerance, although this is the first data that would suggest that, and um, also to quality of life and um, persistence of obesity itself, right? Absolutely. What messages would you like our audience to take home from this really spectacular result and complex set of data you've just presented? Yeah, and maybe before I even get to that, Nancy, just a couple of other points, which I think is going to be interesting to the audience and also uh, clinically important. One is we measured N terminal proBNP or NT proBNP levels. Uh, they were exploratory endpoints. Um, but nevertheless, I think a very interesting, especially in the space where there was so much controversy about this relationship between obesity and weight loss on one hand and anti-proBNP and natriuretic peptides on the other hand. And what we actually saw was there was a, a reduction in anti-proBNP with semaglutide versus placebo estimated treatment ratio 0 0.84 and 95% confidence intervals excluding unity. And we also saw, while there were very few clinical events of heart failure hospitalizations and urgent visits, they were prospectively adjudicated and there were uh, a lot fewer of them in a semaglutide group uh, versus a placebo. There were 13 events of which 12 were in a placebo group and only one in the semaglutide group. Uh, so these data all together, I think, um, uh, in terms of key take home messages, I would say number one, um, obesity is not a just a coexisting condition or comorbidity. It appears to be um, a root cause uh, and an extremely important determinant of both half path development and progression in many of our patients that have this difficult to treat condition. Um, and uh, we now have a very convincing demonstration that when you target obesity, you can substantially uh, improve symptoms and physical limitations that are so common and so important in this disease syndrome. Uh, and this is actually the largest treatment benefit in terms of symptoms and physical limitations that we've ever seen with any drug in half path. And so it really should change the conversation 
uh, about obesity from this comorbidity that we maybe pay lip service to, but don't do much about as cardiologists, um, by and large, to a root cause of half path and the real target for intervention. Um, uh, the other, I think, important take home message is that um, uh, it's uh, very interesting that at least semaglutide mediated weight loss uh, uh, had a significant impact on lowering anti proven P levels and this very tantalizing signal towards fewer clinical events as well. And it suggests that it's not just about weight loss, but uh, there are um, significant decongestive and anti-inflammatory effects, as you pointed out with CRP reduction, that probably are contributing to the effects that we're seeing on changes in KCQ and six-minute walking distance. And possibly, and of course, that's something that should be investigated in the future, maybe clinical events as well, which is what this trial at least is pointing towards. So I think you know, the bottom line kind of take home for me is that this opens now a, an entire field of scientific exploration for truly targeting obesity as a treatment strategy in half path, at least in patients with half paths that have, um, that are living with uh, overweight and obesity. Um, and um, it clinically, I think it gives us yet another tool and what appears to be a really effective tool in doing something very meaningful for our patients, which is great news, of course. Yes, and a disease with so few options. And, you know, as you know, a disease we understand so poorly, I think these are really important. And as you say, tantalizing clues as to what's going on in at least the obese uh, cohort of patients with have to have. Um, and in your data, especially the exploratory endpoints, are so important because it should suggest, as you say, that it's not just losing weight that's making people feel better and move more. It's actually modifying the disease itself. Of I think that's what the data clearly uh, suggests, is that this is not just weight loss. This uh, appears to be disease-modifying therapy uh, based on all of these uh, other measures that we uh, very uh, painstakingly uh, obtained, uh, you know, both at baseline and follow-up. Uh, specifically for that reason, and I think they all point in that direction that it's disease modifying therapy. Well, as the editor of a heart failure journal, I must say I'm very excited not only about your result, which I'm sure will be in a prominent journal today, but also about the um, investigations to come to help us really make some inroads in this resistant disease that we're all struggling with and that's growing in prevalence. Um, and I congratulate you again and all your co-investigators on a spectacular result and very important result, testing GLP-1 agonist therapy in obese HFF patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasparad. Oh, thank you so much, Nancy. It's always a pleasure to be with you, and I appreciate the opportunity.